today we are very happy to say that uh, after the government asked us to change our name to broaden the sort of ambit of our responsibility from an ecotourism society of india to now what is called the responsible tourism society of india we we find we might be at the tipping point because given what has happened to the planet given what you've just heard in terms of covid and you know we've all had our little inner journey as i'm sure in how we want to be as a human being on this planet whether we are with small business big business and indeed what are our impacts so we think that tourism is a powerful force for good but if it is done the right way and it's the same story if it is done the wrong way it can wreak havoc as we have seen with certain rather sad examples of you know mass tourism and so on so uh, we thought that we would uh, as i said earlier that it's a, it's a kind of a pizza of offering uh, you know that we want to bring to ourselves to the industry to many people who are enthused about uh, tourism and doing it right in india and this slice was more mainly looking at certain operational issues that impact the well-being of not only the animals and the forests and so on and the communities but also of the tourism experience so what is it that we can do what is it that we can look at some of the national parks around which have some good practices and indeed at the same time there are some uh, you know i would say bizarrely bureaucratic procedures that we need to unshackle ourselves so to that extent i uh, let me start by first inviting very quickly uh, our two guests who are from a partner organizations where we are intending to sign a memorandum of understanding and the first one is uh, vivek saxena who is a forest officer from the haryana kada himself and he heads the iucn in india and that is the world conservation union and as most of you know and it's a repository of some amazing knowledge and some amazing groundwork that they do i have already uh, been lucky to engage at two of their webinars and what they are doing very sensibly is taking every different landscape and bringing a focus on it so we uh, you know i know i engaged one with uh, ecotourism there was another one on mountains there's something on deserts and soon and they've already done something on oceans and beaches and so on so they are going in a very systematic manner and it'll be a true delight with it to have you as one of our key partners because es rtsoi right now is in the mode of creating a lot of alliances with like minded people and one of them uh, is also uh, the united nations environment program which we are quite excited about because through this knowledge we want to disseminate it to our uh, fellow colleagues at the industry so over to you vivek for your short message to tell us what you are doing at the iucn and how we hope that this partnership can go strong and forward thank you uh, yeah. thank you mandeep and uh, just a minute uh, mr saxena okay if uh, i may i request all panelists to un- uh, mute themselves because there's a lot of uh, background noise thank you uh thank you mandeep and uh, good morning to everyone so iucn international union for conservation of nature uh let me give a little bit background a very brief one that as you already know uh it was set up in 1948 one of the oldest organization and largest conservation network globally uh more than 1100 institutional members that include the governments and the civil society organizations and more than 15000 commission members across the six iucn commissions so it's a unique in the sense that uh, in other conventions the national governments are the members here the governments are also members civil society organizations are also members and uh, institutions are also members so it blends or you can say brings about the expertise or uh, Uh, interaction at various levels and the main mission of the iucn is uh, to influence encourage and assist society uh, india uh, is also the ministry of environment forest and climate change is a member of iucn and we have in india we have more than 
40 institutional members and more than 800 commission members. A strong network. So IUCN in the recent past uh, taking opportunity of the COVID time because in normal times it was quite difficult to bring all the people together at the same time physically. But we could uh, organize one IUCN members forum meeting also in April uh, where all the members participated and uh, there is a plan that how to strengthen this network. Uh, Ministry, Environment, Forest, Climate Change also showed quite keen interest that uh, this uh, uh, network organization, the expertise of different people that would be taken advantage of. And IUCN is also having observer status with the United Nations General Assembly. And the reason behind this, uh, that other governments, when they speak in the United Nations, they speak of in respect of interest of the, within their geographic boundaries. And the voice of the environment, which is common to all nations and does not, not have the geographic boundary, but they need to have, you can say, one agency which need to uh, share the common interest uh, of all the nations. So with these words, uh, uh, I hope that IUCN will be able to partner uh, with the Responsible Tourism Organization, uh, of Ecotourism Society of India, which uh, Mandeep, uh, earlier it was Ecotourism Society of India. Now uh, the word responsible itself indicates that during the post-COVID times, uh, though word has been added responsible, but we need to be now more and more responsible. And at the same time, when we talk of the tourists in national parks and the sanctuary, the number of other issues which will be deliberated during the today's webinar. But one thing is in the new normals that how the tourists will go, what sort of a, a norms to be there, the carrying capacity so that we don't put extra pressure while we go to national parks and sanctuaries. So these will be the key uh, issues. And for this, uh, we IUCN is also organizing a right now six episode webinar series. And the four already we have done. The first one was the general one that post COVID, what type of new challenges are there to sustain the tourism? Because tourism generates more than four crore livelihoods. And now with the COVID thing, uh, suddenly everything coming to the standstill. So you can imagine the linkages of these livelihood, the various linkages between the tour operators, the movement and all. So that has come to a standstill. But if we have to move further within these constraints, how to uh, redesign or how to reorient our strategy to ensure sustainable livelihood and also sustainable tourism. These are the new challenges and that has to be so we organized this series based on the landscape, different type of sectors. One web uh, series, it was the mountain based, one was related to the adv adventure tourism, one was related to the coastal areas. So different type of things and uh, with these webinar things based on the, we had a very, very good panelist during this webinar and very some good suggestions have come out and we will be compiling them and uh, presenting for the, at appropriate level so that uh, so they can be integrated into the future ecotourism related the governance mechanism or at the policy level. So IUCN will be too much happy to partner with the Responsible Ecotourism Society of India and uh, taking these initiatives further. And if uh, any sort of further uh, partnership is required in terms of conservation related aspects that when the tourists go how to ensure at the same time, we have to sensitize them that the biodiversity also, also to be conserved we have to ensure that uh, too much tourists don't uh, move at the same place at the same time because sometimes what happens when the, we see the challenges that uh, opportunity during the holiday rush and all, a lot of bookings we take, especially tour operators. At the same time, there is a challenge that within those national parks and the sanctuary, there is an issue of the time. These type of pressures are also built up. So everyone has a very, very important role. Uh, uh, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Vivek. That's very well put. And uh, we look forward to all, all sort of working aspects together, specifically on the ecotourism policy, which is one of our new or uh, forthcoming webinars, because as we all know, the Ministry of Environment and Forests uh, have actually uh, been sitting on a draft policy, which is nearly coming to fruition. And a lot of us have been in the response mode and so on, but that we'll take on uh, separately. Now, very quickly to uh, our wonderful Dr. S.P. Singh, 
who heads the sustainability wing in the Amity University. And it's also a great delight. Uh, he's a former uh, PCCF, uh, Principal Chief Conservator of Forests, and has been adopted or you know, uh, pulled in by the Amity University to actually head a very interesting uh, department, which also has been given the responsibility of sensitizing like a refresher course for senior forest officials around the country. And in that, we as the uh, former Ecotourism Society and now RTSOI have been going and uh, giving lectures on the pluses and minuses of ecotourism and tourism and so on. And there's been a great engagement. And obviously, there are still lots of forest officers who feel that, uh, you know, uh, tourism is a bit of a pain in the neck. And there are others who feel that obviously tourism is a very powerful tool and we must use it to the benefit of conservation and community. So, uh, SP, over to you, if you can give us a quick message on, uh, and we are hoping to collaborate with you, not only on a long term, but also uh, in a sense, a long term where we create a course, maybe at uh, Amity University on ecotourism, so that the young people uh, might be able to take this diploma course or some such. So over to you and very quickly, we can hear your message uh, before we plunge into um, our, our uh, further discussions. Thanks. Uh, we can't hear you, SP. So. Santosh? Oh. We, we have a small audio glitch on this. We, we can't hear you, Santosh. Okay. Um, oh, dear. Okay, Shobha. Could we uh, get him back uh, after we fielded uh, Harbhajan Pabla because we can't get his audio. So maybe you can text him on the side and get him to be uh, tech ready and I'll uh, invite our next speaker before we break out into our panel discussions and hopefully we can get SV back to give his message. Yes, sir. But, I'm just, uh, yes, yeah? Mandy, I'm just doing that. Yeah. Okay. So let me let me come back to uh, what Harbhajan Pabla, who is of for a honorary member, memories. Then we have uh, Mr. Pabla, and then we have Maharaja Gad Singh out of Jodhpur. Now, he's been an active forest officer for about 35 years, and he retired as a chief wildlife warden out of Madhya Pradesh. And he has also been an international consultant on forestry and wildlife in various countries like uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, etc. But more importantly, he's written three very hard-hitting books. W one of them is called Road to Nowhere. The other one is Wardens in Shackles. And his third and recent offering, which is uh, as of, I believe, only a few weeks old, is called Laws at War. As in, you know, uh, the laws are, are seemingly clashing with each other. So he's always been a great proponent of uh, how we should and can use tourism to the betterment of uh, conservation. And I know he speaks with a lot of passion and, uh, you know, uh, ground sort of experience that he's had. So I thought we'll ask him to set the tone in the next few minutes before we open it out to our wonderful field directors who've come uh, to join us in order to eradicate some of these ground level issues and how we can basically proceed to make tourism much better for, uh, you know, in a kind of a ideal world, which is a win-win scenario. 
So over to you, Arbhajan. Give us your thoughts on uh, uh, what you've been writing, uh, you know, copiously in your books. Uh, and obviously this lockdown has been pretty good for you to churn out some wonderful stuff for us to ruminate on. So over to you. Mandy, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, good morning to all the old uh, and new friends, some known, some unknown. And it's great to be among uh, my old colleagues here. Uh, talking about the subject, uh, uh, it is quite close to my heart. And uh, probably I'm a little infamous for uh, having it too close to my heart. I hope I'm audible. OK. Now, uh, without taking a lot of time, uh, let me rush through whatever little I want to say. I think we have come quite a long way since the 1980s when I active, uh, became active in the Forest Service, uh, probably and, and a long way to go as well. That was a time when uh, we got very few visitors to our parks. And still we continue to say, even at that time, that the tourism is a distraction, it's, a, it's a some kind of encumberment. And our job is core forestry, core conservation, and we have to spend time on this little distraction. Uh, at that time, we saw wildlife tourism as some kind of a favor we were doing to the society by letting people in. And uh, the main objective of letting people into parks used to be uh, awareness raising, sensitizing people, educating people about what uh, conservation is, what uh, conservation issues are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, we did not have any idea of the economic power and the power of tourism to conserve nature, forest, and wildlife at that time. So at that time, it was, I must say that we were all passive about uh, conservation. But I think towards the end of the century, uh, by 2003, 4, 5, uh, a lot of foresters realized that uh, tourism can be a very powerful conservation tool. It can be helpful in conserving and doing what we wanted to do. And uh, I think the real uh, change in Madhya Pradesh uh, tourism uh, mindset came when the government uh, ordered that you can retain all your revenues from tourism for park management. Look, that happened somewhere in 19, I think five or six, but uh, it consolidated over time. And so after that, uh, we started increasing our tariff rates and slowly maybe then uh, more awareness came, more people started coming and it became very significant uh, uh, contribution to our conservation budget. And uh, then we also became aware by that time that uh, societies, people living around the parks were critical to the survival of our parks. And those people are suffering because we have a park next door where they can, cannot go. They've been using those resources for a very long time, but we have now stopped them. And if conservation is successful, we have more animals, they suffer more because then we have more animals with there to contend with and their crop losses will be more or the protection against uh, uh, crop losses will cost more. Sometimes they lose livestock, sometimes they lose even children. So uh, conservation uh, and tourism somehow had to be wedded together to make them successful. So over time, I have developed uh, several little uh, phrases about uh, wildlife tourism. Uh, I call it uh, as the means and motive for conservation as well. Conservation uh, tourism is the means of conserving nature. At the same time, it is also the motive for conserving. Because if you don't uh, uh, make conservation pay for itself and the conservation doesn't earn its, uh, its, its keep, society is not, the Indian especially, the, the poorer countries are not that rich that they can spend sufficient amounts, sufficient resources on conserving uh, wildlife and, and forest. So as, uh, uh, because uh, the, the conservation, uh, the tourism can generate resources which can be plowed back into conservation as a very powerful tool for conservation. At the same time, we have uh, very, very big uh, areas which have been conserved primarily because those countries wanted uh, tourism. We, they, the countries want like, even the Yellowstone National Park, Yosemite National Park, they were created primarily not for conservation. Conservation came as a byproduct. 
uh, they were primarily produced, uh, created by those governments because they wanted the people of those countries to be able to visit and enjoy uh, those areas. And uh, I think uh, tourism is a probably one of the most important innovations of uh, modern man, which has a double advantage. It conserves natural resources, and at the same time, it produces jobs and GDP as well. I don't think there's any, any other industry, any other vocation, any other activity, which has these two very, very big advantages. We can have a development, we can produce resources, we can produce money, uh, uh, without destroying nature, rather tourism and conservation can only survive if the other survives. If you have tourism, that we have, we are successful in conservation. At the same time, if you do not conserve, a conservation is not successful. You can't have ecotourism. You can't have wildlife tourism. So, by and large, to me, conservation and uh, wildlife tourism are essentially the two sides of the same coin. And we must continue to ensure that they continue to be related that way. And uh, we do not uh, see that tourism in any way uh, somehow comes in the way of conserving natural resources. Now, I think a very important part of uh, tourism, uh, I mean, the a very important property of tourism is that is it reduces the pain of conservation. Conservation is a very painful uh, uh, activity for any nation because you have to snatch those resources from the local people. You have to tell them, no, you can't graze their livestock here. You can't bring the fuel wood from there. You can't make the living the way you've been doing uh, so far. At the same time, uh, then when you have successful conservation, as I said, you have more wild animals to contend with and people have to suffer more. Why? Tourism is the only way through which you can soften that blow by creating jobs and providing employment for the people who are the victims of, of conservation. So I think uh, if we do not have tourism, because hunting is out of question in our, in, in our country at the moment, tourism is the only way through which you can uh, make uh, conservation affordable and even desirable to the people of our country. I remember when we set up Panna National Park, I was the first director. Everybody thought the National Park was being created to promote tourism. Very few people linked it with our primary desire to, to protect wildlife. They thought uh, now Gora people will come in that area and uh, we'll, we'll have uh, white people moving around in our, in our area. That was probably one of the criticisms we, we faced. But they didn't link it with wildlife. They thought this place, this is a park. A park means a beautiful place and we want people from other uh, countries or other cities to come into that area. Now, uh, but going uh, on and on, I think uh, we are in a very critical situation now. Wildlife tourism is useful. I think we won't, I don't think we need to need to preach to the converted. Now, with the uh, Corona going on, although we were talking about post-COVID tourism, but I don't think we have post-COVID stage anywhere near so uh, as yet. You don't know how long it's going on. I think the contribution in tourism can make both to the revenues of the parks as well as jobs for the communities are going to be much more important than what they have been so far. I'm very sure the conservation budgets are going to go down drastically and park man managers are have to cut down the, on their employment. They may be to, have to reduce their chokidas or daily wage staff or maybe there will be probably no money for works. The only money government probably will be able to pay is, is for salaries. So if they do not generate uh, resources locally, generate revenues locally, I think conservation is going to suffer hugely. At the same time, lots of jobs for the people who have been living in the, in the, around the parks. Probably they were working as migrant laborers in big cities. They have come back now. So they have to find employment somewhere. If we do not somehow employ them gainfully in tourism related activities with the, with the government or with the, or, the, or the service industry, a lot of them might become criminals. They might become uh, poachers or uh, they start felling and selling trees or whatever. So I think now we are absolutely in a, in, a, in a bind now, even those of my friends who did not embrace tourism as a tool for conservation now, I think they have to look uh, at it very seriously because 
I think most states now have gone the way Madhya Pradesh was 10, 20 years ago that most money generated by parks stays with the parks, if not fully, maybe to, to a large extent. So that money can become a very important uh, tool for conserving uh, the, what, what, so, what is so, so dear to, to all of us. But the problem, I think, always is what kind of tourism? Uh, although globally tourism has been accepted as a very powerful, very potent tool for conservation and community development, we in India are slightly hesitant, slightly reluctant about uh, embracing tourism. We have been getting government advisories for more than 10, 15 years that uh, tourism should be phased out, tourism should be reduced in protected areas, etc., etc. Those concerns are valid, but I think there are ways of uh, maximizing the benefits from tourism at the same time, minimizing its impact. Rather than concentrating huge numbers of people into small areas, we can spread them thinly, widely. Rather than letting people or asking people to do it, to enjoy the entire park only in one way in the form of game drives, we can diversify uh, the activities. The people should be able to enjoy it through several ways. They can walk, they can bike, they can camp, they can sit in watchtowers or hide or, or whatever. And wherever we have water bodies, I think there are many more options. I think that will, and uh, then, then, then there'll be, if we spread our tourism thinly and widely, you don't have to worry about the carrying capacity issues then. You have to worry about the carrying capacity, high density, high impact only when you try to confine people into very small areas. So I think we have to now take another look at the way we do tourism in our uh, protected areas. First thing I think we have to do is to consciously embrace tourism as a core mainstream responsibility of the forest department. We have to, forest department has to be held accountable for ensuring how tourism is doing in these parks, not only in parks, in all our forest areas, this recreation should be one of the principal jobs, principal objectives of management of forests. And uh, then uh, we must maximize uh, whatever benefits we can generate for the, for the government as well as for the communities. At the same time, must ensure that in no way tourism impacts forests and wildlife adversely. As I said, there are ways of minimizing impacts by dispersing and diversifying tourism. Uh, at the same time, there's ways of maximizing revenues by again diversifying as well as maximizing numbers. Now, if we open only very small area, you can accommodate only very small number of people. But if you have large areas and even the density is low, still you can have a large number of uh, people coming and uh, generating whatever benefits we were looking at. So I think I would uh, stop here and wish you all the very best, best and a wonderful discussion. I look forward to an engaging discussion between the industry leaders as well as uh, my colleagues from the forest department. And I hope we end the day with something which we can all uh, uh, be sure that is going to help uh, in the days to come. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Mandy, uh, uh, hmm. yeah, Mr. Yeah. S.P. Singh is uh, Mr. S.P. Singh is there. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So thanks for that, uh, Dr. Pabla. I think that was brilliant, and I think they were just the important gems that you sort of, you know, set in the crown of wildlife tourism here. And I, 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 if I had my way, I would actually make your books, the prescribed books in schools and colleges, and certainly we'll promote it at our society and in our travel industry, because much of these are things that we really need to embrace. And not only that, I think we'll also then request uh, the naysayers in the government uh, to, to really be very actively uh, considered. I think you, you raised a very important point about the poaching and the alternative sources of income that are drying up through tourism. And we can bring that back into discussion later. Let me go back Thank very you, quickly to uh, Santosh. If your uh, audio is good and yeah. running, uh, Santosh, would you like to yeah. say something quick and uh, before we move on to the panel, please? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mani. But uh, I ho hope I am audible now. Yes, huh. sir. Yeah, you are audible. Huh. Sir, if you can move away oh. slightly from oh, yeah. the camera, yeah, yeah. we can see you completely. Yes, thank uh -huh. you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so let me uh, about the MIT School of Natural Resources. I'm a firm believer in ecotourism.
livelihood and forest conservation. It is a triangle which will work now. We now we have a, also a message from our honorable prime minister that we should be Atmanirbar. If we want to be Atmanirbar in the management of our forest areas, especially protected areas, we have to believe in ecotourism. And I, ecotourism, it is a way, responsible tourism. How can you take the people? And uh, whatever Dr. Pavla Saab said, that we have to open more area. Yes, of course. We should protect ourselves to the protected areas, but there are so many other biodiversity areas, different kind not flora and fauna, and each flora and fauna is amazing, amazing, amazing. And therefore, for the point of sustainability, we believe in the sustainability, we require uh, the ecotourism. And ecotourism with the help of the local people who are there. If you break this chain, the things will again reverse to the backside, the local people will get more resented. They will go for poaching. If you involve them, make them ownership, make them fully responsible for this, and possibly we may be able to manage better. I always think positive after this COVID. This is the right time. People are not rushing to the uh, uh, places. Now we can harmonize that what kind of tourism uh, is going to And I was the field director in Assam, Manas, and uh, the places like Ajiranga. We always feel very bad that we are all the time busy with uh, tourism, uh, wildlife tourism, and we get less chance. But now I have come on the other side. Now we really recognize that it is a very, very important part for the sustainability. Being a short time, I just want to stop myself. Thank you very much, Mandeep. Thank you, uh, Santosh. Very well uh, put. And I am glad we are all on the same page. And we look forward to creating this special uh, sort of a diploma course or a degree course or whatever in the future so that we can get more uh, enthusiastic students, uh, you know, for ecotourism and waving the flag continuously. Okay, uh, people, I think we now need to break into our sort of discussion mode. And for that, I'm very quickly going to introduce all our panelists and then we will field some questions between. Uh, government and industry and hopefully try and come to some sort of a conclusion. Uh, so let me start with uh, Lakshman Krishna Murthy, who is with us from uh, Kana. He's the field director of Kana. If you can just raise your hand. Of course, your name is displayed. So that's great. Um, as I discovered, he's also a, not discovered, as I remembered, that he's also a wonderful uh, recipient of this amazing award that was created by the World Wildlife India and the PATA, which is the Pacific Asia Travel Association. And it is called the Bag Mitra Award. And I happen to be on the jury for the last so many years. And we, we know that some, this is a, this is a expression of the tourism industry really coming together and saying, let us honor these wonderful guys who are out in the field and they're no different to the soldiers that fight at our borders and so on, which are anti-poaching or wonderful other stuff. So there is a prize that is given to a uh, person and there is a category of a prize given to the best managed national park. So I'm so delighted that Lakshman Krishnamurti is with us. And on a lighter note, uh, Krishna, if you grow those mustaches any longer, you'll have no problem in chasing away the poachers anyway. So uh, keep up your good work. And uh, let me come to our field director all the way from Kaziranga, who comes in with a 20 year service, also hugely awarded for his afforestation work with the MOEFCC award and also the Assam government award. So we are delighted that you will be uh, talking and engaging with us. And from the industry side, we start with the Sardar with the long beard, and that is no other than Ravi Kalra, who runs a company called Travel In, which has been going since 1990 and does some significant amount of wildlife business uh, from different parts of the world. And he is pretty aware of the sort of pain points of, uh, you know, transacting this wildlife uh, safaris and tourism in the different national parts of the country. So we will ask him to, uh, Shoba, can you mute uh, some of the speakers? Uh, like, 
I think we've got background noises. Yes, I'm just doing that. From Santosh, I think. Um, sorry about that. So the next one we have is um, Varun Mathur, who represents uh, Jungle Sutra, who actually was a marketing person with Shobha earlier, has now uh, given way to his passion, as most of us in this wonderful tourism industry are driven by. And he works for uh, Creative Travels under the brand called Jungle Sutra. And it's interesting that his designation is head of the jungle. Okay. So uh, then we move on to our friend Ali Rashid, who is, of course, a great naturalist and a, a you know, passionate environmentalist. And he owns and runs uh, the, the Rainy Pani Lodge. And they also have the Jahan Numa Palace, which has been going on since 1983 in Bhopal. And it's a personal pleasure that I've actually done this amazing walk with him in the Satpura National Park, which is the walking safari, which of course Ali will explain is a result of some of the discussions which led to this wonderful expansion of the tourism experience for people. And I think that's the kind of thing that we are looking in, in many other national parks to take place. And finally, we have Anirudh Chauji, who is not only our treasurer of the RTSY, but has a very unique uh, short history of going from an entrepreneur in the private sector, creating pug marks for school students to do uh, you know, nature-based uh, treks and holidays, and now has joined the government, and he works at the Taroba National Park, uh, earlier with Melghat. And uh, he also comes with a lot of uh, knowledge about what can be done now that he's on both sides of the fence. So may I just uh, kick it off by asking Ravi to take on uh, the first of his questions, which are the immediate pain points. Uh, and one of them I know, which is a burning issue in the industry, is that, uh, you know, given what has happened with COVID, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's very important that uh, whether as a private sector or as a government, we at least convey our sincerity to uh, or, or our responsibility to the greater tourism fraternity. And I believe there are some issues where monies have been paid by customers who were stopped dead in their tracks thanks to the unfortunate COVID. But unfortunately, a lot of the state governments, forest departments have not refunded this, which has got some amount of tomato on our face and or egg on our face, and that is not so happy. So with that, uh, Ravi, would you like to lead that question yes. and a few other uh, to um, the, the field directors, please? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I thank Mr. Pabla for establishing that tourism is a, as a tool of conservation, uh, produce business in harmony with nature, uh, and also the forest officer to become more tourism friendly. Now, these are all very good things to hear, but we will need to look at the reality and practicality of the things. The question is, are our forest officers as friendly as they ought to be? And all our, are our policies as tourist friendly as tourism friendly as they ought to be. First of all, you know, if we have to look forward, Mandeep, and we have to look at how we regenerate our businesses after the corona pandemic, we need to be very clear on certain directives of the park authorities. We need to be very clear as on to what are the costs going to be for the safaris till 19, at least 2022. We are looking at booking positions for 21 onwards, and we don't even know uh, how the park authorities will do, what they will do when it comes to raising their tickets, when it comes to coming out with safari rules. So all I'm saying is, since it's established that tourism and for, forest department has to go hand in hand, and we have to harmonize conservation with tourism, which are more dependent on each other, I would like to, you know, our park authorities, our fast departments to be very clear on entry costs for next three years, 
on rules for the jeeps, safaris, and everything, so that when we go to our operators or our foreign markets, we are able to sell, uh, you know, not only for short term, we are able to sell for a long term. And we are able to tell them, okay, these are our prices, valid till 2022, there's going to be no change, and this is what you're going to get. Rather than having a sudden surprise thrown at us, park close for census without any pre-information, bookings already confirmed, park closed for Wednesdays, park will be closed to, you know, for this, this is date, for this, this activity. What about the businesses which we already booked and taken a lot of pain to, to get into? So my question would be to all our dear field officers from forest department that are we in practically as tourism friendly as we claim to be? So Krishna, would you like to take that on first and then we can ask Siva for his comments? I'm afraid uh, it looks like uh, we've not been able to get Manoj uh, from Ranthambore, but if he logs in, wonderful. Otherwise, would you like to field it uh, one by one, please? Since you are the field directors. <laughs> Mr. Krishnamurti, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon to all. Uh, thanks for inviting me in this webinar. So, as uh, Dr. Pabla sir told, in Madhya Pradesh, the tourism rules are uh, well uh, established and the procedures are very simple. I have gone through many questions also, which you shared with me. So, as the rates, regarding the rate and all, already the last time in the stakeholders meeting in the government of Madhya Pradesh, sorry, in Bhopal, so it was decided the rates for the next year will be only 10% increase. So, this was informed last time only. So, there is a clear cut policy on pricing and all. And then there are many other issues, questions also came. I just wanted to clarify that. Regarding the refunding, I think in Madhya Pradesh, I think almost for all the parts, we refunded all the money, uh, except few parts. That's because of the COVID problem at the uh, MP online side. So the refunding part, I think we uh, paid it to all our guests back whenever we canceled their uh, safaris. And uh, regarding um, Mr. Kalra was telling the park is uh, uh, closed without any information. In Madhya Pradesh, I think the parks, uh, the uh, tourism season is well defined from 1st October to then 30th June and every uh, Holi and uh, Diwali is the national holidays and those two days our park is closed and every week on Wednesday afternoon it's a holiday. So uh, regarding the park opening and closure, it's I think very well, uh, clearly it has been uh, spelt out in Madhya Pradesh. So we don't have any uh, problem in that. So coming back to a few points from my side, uh, of course, we believe tourism is a tool for our conservation. We focus on uh, tourism. The, though, uh, uh, apart from tourism, our main role is conservation. So we, we, of course, we do conservation also and we promote tourism also. We have regular uh, meetings with the stakeholders and our job is also to provide employment to the local communities and we have to involve all the stakeholders. We are trying to do all the uh, best things possible in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, and the other important thing uh, as a park director, so what is tourism for me? For me, providing a responsible and wilderness experience inside the park is my duty. Not that it's a mass tourism inside the park. So we, I have to ensure all these things inside whenever my guests, my tourists, they went, enter the park, these things has to be uh, followed and they, they should go back with the rich experience of wildlife. So here comes, um, uh, there were discussion on the increasing the vehicles, uh, the carrying capacity and all. Let me say that the facts from the Kana Tiger Reserve. See, out of uh, 270 days in a year, so only 40, 45 days we have 100% booking. So we don't talk about the other things, uh, other, thing, other days, the remaining say 230 days, how to utilize that 100% carrying capacity. And there, there is a talk of diversifying the activities and all. We do diversify all the activities, but the, the, uh, the tourism industry particularly, they're not promoting the many activities like nature walks, then camping, and we have uh, night safaris and all. People ask why you are not allowing night safaris. We have night safari facilities. Every day we allow five vehicles. There, hardly there are takers. So there are so many things already in place. There are, there are so many things already available in the park. So those things are not completely utilized to the maximum potential. So the industry and the department, we should think over it, how to utilize that complete potential. 
so then we should think about uh, ex, uh, uh, and moreover yeah, of course the other issue is also we have to promote other buffer area tourism and other tourism in the territorial areas and all so we have to think about that uh, instead of um, asking uh, asking or uh, promoting the tourism only in the tiger reserve so that's my point yeah. so then uh, sure. can i can i interject here there are two points uh, we'd like to keep this uh, going as a discussion so you raised the point about that the government has already made a decision of a 10% increase in prices and that is likely to stay i think what the industry and what i would also question here is that given the situation of covid given the fact that you are not going to have too many travelers coming out of the woodwork to go rushing into national parks because everybody is scared would it not be a futuristic policy to actually reduce that 10% slash it away and in fact reduce another further 10% you know because this is a challenging time and how do you actually get not only your international traveler because they are not going to start until maybe early next year i don't think anybody is going to come back in the post monsoon when your parks open in october november because simply the international flights are not going to be totally buzzing there will be a lot of protocols and they will be a kind of a hampering to that growth so that is one question for us really to think about that what are the little lollipops that we can offer to the industry so that they can go and promote and i think uh, this is something that we need to do jointly i mean i'll give you the analogy of uh, the indian mountaineering foundation which is the fountain head for all the mountaineering peaks and every mountain peak in uh, has a royalty just like you have a royalty or a charge for going into a national park there again the thinking is that maybe we need to reduce the fees we need to make these lollipops for people to come because we are you know in a in a special spot so i think yeah. that is something certainly uh, we want to leave for you and i want to give you one piece of good news and the good news is just as we are aware that a lot of uh, travelers are the pain points or indeed the lack of the industry knowledge which you very rightly pointed out is that if we don't do alternatives of night safaris of going to different parks i think there are two things here one is that we are launching a responsible traveler campaign which the ministry of tourism in conjunction with our society is going to do in which we will talk about all these things and we will talk about that you are not going to uh, you are not supposed to run after the tiger alone you know you are supposed to enjoy the jungle in its holistic sort of magic and all that will come through but may i also uh, say that at that point um perhaps we need to in conjunction with some of our private lodges and the forest department just go way way beyond the current scenario of the quality of interpretation of the guides because you know like many of us we've traveled around the world and we can see and i can tell you in my personal case i was in the jungles of uh, the amazon in peru and we were just arrested for about 45 minutes trying to study the butterfly ant you know doing its little job and i mean you know that's the kind of magic i know a lot of naturalists bring so i thought i'll park that with you but let me now come across to uh siva for his comments before uh, you know you you come back with us with some uh, further ammo siva over to you uh mandy can i quickly butt in and add one more very strong uh, pain point which uh, since we have different field directors with us the pain point is synergy between the parks i mean krishna uh, muti ji just mentioned that madhya pradesh has refunded the safari amount what about ranthambore what about rajasthan they're not even talking about it there's no synergy here so if we give a very good park experience in let's say madhya pradesh mm. the experience has to be duplicated in kajiranga in ranthambo so that we are on the on that same plate so so i'm sorry i had to interject but there is a pain point here if if madhya pradesh is doing something which is right why not uh, the same thing is being looked at or or duplicated by ranthambo or let's say kajiranga thank absolutely. you absolutely wonderful wonderful point well taken i'm sure and i'll feel that over to siva and basically we need to evolve a strategy where you know some of these best practices can of course flow into all our uh, sort of you know national parks that would be 
uh, you know, a great, great uh, sort of a target to have. So over to you, Siva, for your comments first. I think you're on mute. Sorry, you are on mute. She's not on mute, Mandy, unable oh. to hear him. Uh, oh. Yeah, so he has to uh, probably log in again. Can't hear him. Oh, dear. Okay. So I uh, know okay, I'll put so, it on the chat. Uh, okay. okay. So if, if you tell him, then we can go quickly back to Krishna for his uh, supplementary comment on that. Uh, you need okay. to be off mute, uh, Krishna. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, regarding the uh, pricing and all, you know, in Madhya Pradesh, since uh, 2016, we have not increased any entry fee for the last uh, four, three years, four years. And for uh, for the next year, I think the government has registered a 10% increase, but I think I'm not the right person to comment on that, whether it, it will be increased or it will be retained. Uh, certainly, I can... Uh, take these points and they can discuss with the government or uh, chief federal warden. So coming back to the pricing, what you're talking is that uh, in Madhya Pradesh, we charge 1500 rupees per vehicle for six persons. So we talk about responsible tourism In responsible tourism. I do believe my personal view is that we have to help the conservation and the local communities in Madhya Pradesh, whatever we get the tourism receives 33% we share with the local communities who are uh, bearing the cost of the conservation. So by reducing this price, you are going to uh, deprive some resources to the local communities. We are all talking about the supporting the local communities in increasing the empl employment opportunities. And moreover, this money is also flowed back for conservation works. So do we really think that 1500 rupees per vehicle is too high in this tourism sector currently? If you see a person who comes from any, any place, how much, will, how much percentage will be this cost? So my uh, personal view and request is that this money is used for conservation and for local communities. I think uh, we should stick to what the uh, current rates are there. If not, uh, there is an increase at least. I think the I think we should not ask for any reduction in the entry tickets. That's my personal opinion. Okay, I, I will ask my other colleagues to respond on that. I think you make a valid point. If it is that amount right now, maybe we should stick with it. Although there are many other ways that tourism can support. And, and one it, more thing, in Madhya Pradesh, we don't, uh, we don't charge multiple charges also, like camera fee or other things. Only one uh, fee we take and we don't take other uh, fees. So it's fair enough. The rate is, I don't think it's very high when a person who comes to Kana and all. And the third yeah. point I want to make is that uh, regarding the promoting other areas, though we are sitting in Kana, my Fen Wildlife Sanctuary, the tour, tour operators and the resort owners and the guides, they are not willing to take the guests to Fen Sanctuary. It's just 60 kilometers from Mukki Gate. So we have to explore those unknown areas, wilderness areas to promote tourism. So that is also very, very important. It's the responsibility of the tourism industry also to focus on those lesser known places right now. No doubt, no doubt. And I think, uh, as I mentioned, there are many other ways of coming around to tourism dollars, tourism rupees, supporting communities such as foundations that were created, I think, in, uh, you know, Bandavgarh or something between industry and uh, government. But yeah, at 1500, I do accept the point. But the other small corollary, which I think Ravi made earlier, was that because you're dealing both with domestic and international tourism, please at least freeze the rates that there will be a no increase for the next three years. Because if you understand the tourism process, they put it into a brochure, they promote the brochure, one year later it is sold, uh, second year it is transacted. So in the middle, if there is a hike, then obviously the private sector has to bear the brunt. So point well made. But let me ask uh, Varun, I think he was raising a point and possibly Anirudh, because they are a little aware of all these uh, price structures and what the other issues are. So Varun, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, See, I think... Um, hi. Uh, I think the point made by Mr. Kalra and as well as, you know, uh, what you said about 1500 rupees, it's not much. But I think what Mr. Kalra was trying to get at is, um, is a broader perspective of lack of consistency. You know, we think about our parks or state, a particular state and the parks that there are in. But we need to look at India as a broader segment. You know, we have different rules and I know it's all state run and I'm trying to oversimplify, but we need to simplify things for travelers from overseas. They do not understand these logics where 
you know you have uh, you can do private games of parties in madhya pradesh but you can't do them in karnataka or uh, you know in in some areas uh, uh, a lodge naturalist can be a driver but in other parks they cannot you know this adds an additional person in the vehicle so we are losing out on a seat uh, those are little little things that need to be considered you know uh, within mp itself we have some parks that follow the gps system some parks that don't so if you are traveling with a guest uh, you need to explain all of this and i think it is a great thing that mp does not it has one consolidated fee and you do not have camera fee because that can be further cumbersome because you know uh, uh, you know you're traveling to let's say gujarat you are paying you know x amount of money per camera per safari we need to popularize the natural diversity of india india needs to be seen as a wildlife destination in itself it does not have to be known just for taj mahal or whatever and we have so much to talk about not just tigers you know when we travel overseas we realize many people don't even realize how much there is in india you know uh, and that is the point i think mr kalra was trying to drive that on a broader perspective it can look at you know have some uniformity i i know it's all state run but have some uniformity within the tiger reserves you know where uh, some basics remain the same you know whereas if somebody wants to do an exclusive ride you can do an exclusive ride uh, i think that is something to think about for a longer term rather than you know just a uh, just a focus point being pricing i agree with you pricing yes 1500 rupees is uh, is something that is doable but uh, as mandeep pointed out we are trying to look at a longer term where we freeze the time over maybe two or three years at least uh, because we are selling in the future we are not selling for somebody who's traveling next week or two two days uh, two months down the line we are, tra- we are selling to somebody who, who's you know maybe a year or two years away from traveling to india mandy uh... yeah so Sorry, go you... ahead no I, i just wanted to say uh, varun's to, uh, for varun's question mr Sh- uh, shivakumar is there i mean he yes i he just saw back. him coming yeah. back so i hope your audio is good shiva and over to you maybe you can feel that uh, question and what uh, krishna had talked about earlier how easy do you think as far as your park is concerned first and how do you think uh, is there a way that we can create a mechanism which is taking some of the best practices sharing it together you know i don't know even harbhajan could come in later and say can we create this kind of a component within the amity course that is done for senior officers so they understand that we need to rationalize uh, you know tourism and tourism's kind of price structures to some degree and camera fees and all these little little things that have been going on for years you know and uh, Uh, sorry arbhajan did you want to say something now no okay so why don't we ask uh, shiva to give his comment uh shiva we can't uh, shiva uh, shiv kumar sir we can't hear you again oh dear okay now i take mr uh, uh, varun's question oh, okay yeah okay uh, uh, regarding the uh, rules and policies which he is talking about i, I am talking with respect to madhya pradesh so in our state i think the rules and regulations across the parks is almost same there will be minor uh, local rules which we impose like he was talking about gps in kana so why we went to that uh, model gps because if the the tourism industry that the vehicle owners drivers guides if they Uh, do responsibly the tourism inside the park then there is no need for me to do the policing work so what is happening is this uh, uh, i i tourism parks you have lot of vehicles so there is always the overcrowding and uh, garrowing the animal so and we want to monitor the ve- vehicles movement also because of that we have introduced that uh, app i am telling you because of that app that we get good feedback from even the guests that wilderness experience in well, kana is, is better than any other park so these are sir, all the positives of that Shukumar technology sir, i think we, i think we should we should oh my god you uh, shobha shobha we we put uh, krishna on mute
I think I am audible now. Yeah. No, you so, are audible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just I wanted to answer Mr. Varun's yeah. uh, question. That uh, so, right, completely, to... I completely agree with you. But I think Bandavgarh, Panna, everything else should also follow the same. Because I think okay. it's a fantastic thing that Pench and Kana are doing with the GPS system. And, and I just I will experience the uh, I will share my experiences about the usage of this app, Bagira app. We also take the feedback about the behavior of the guides, drivers, and the experience inside the park and the uh, facilities available for the tourists. So this is important feedback for me to improve to provide the facilities to the guests and also the other facilities inside the park. So it's a very useful app. I think it has been recognized by even NTCA that it's an innovative app and we are doing it in Madhya Pradesh. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me go, uh, let me go to Anirudh, who's also got a point here. And again, he knows of certain best practices before I come to Ali, because I think one of the star experiences that I have seen is the walking safari and Ali, you should be asking, uh, you know, how we can replicate that because that to my mind is such a unique and a wonderful experience and it can certainly be done in many parks. So over to you, Anirudh. Uh, thanks, Manny. Uh, Krishna, so amazing. Um, we've been hearing so much about uh, Anna and especially this part where you're taking the feedback from the customers, as we will call them, um, it's brilliant. Um, something that other places also should start. Taraba benefited immensely ever since we started taking feedback. The point you are making is also very valid. Uh, Ravi, so this is something that we said, you know, safari is a great. When Krishnamurti Zor mentioned about the activity, so initially, when Taruba introduced, we have uh, about 10 activities which people can do other than going on a safari. So initially, these activities were totally not bought. Nobody even bothered to go for these activities. So this is where we realized that the travel operators and the resort owners, more to do with the resort owners, they always went for the lowest hanging fruit and always went for the tiger. It was very simple. And which may be they wanted to only see one of our tigers is called Maya, eat well, and nothing else. So even if there was an elephant which had climbed the tree, no, I'm not interested in seeing that. I want to see the tiger. But then to that extent. But then again, to what uh, Krishna said mentioned, the stakeholders. So earlier, the resort owners were, you know, they looked upon as enemies of the cause. At Taruba, we started this process of uh, identifying stakeholders and resort owners and travel operators became our major stakeholders along with the guides and drivers and other people. Only when the discussion started, did people realize, oh, we also have a boating, we have a cycling, we have beautiful nature trail, we can sit on a machan, we can sit on a log at night. So involving the stakeholders became a major part. Uh, of the success of these activities. Mm -hmm. But yeah, without uh, people's involvement, I mean, we can run many activities where no one will buy them. Thanks. Okay, uh, that's, that's very useful. So, uh, Ali, why don't you give your comments? And then I'm going to pose the question to Harbhajan because uh, we need to institutionalize this mechanism of the osmosis of good ideas between the park directors, obviously, right? So why don't you give us your comments and your feedback in terms of Satpura and I know now you are going to operate in Bori, which is a good example of actually popularizing a lesser known park. And I think lodge owners and tour operators absolutely, like Krishna said, have the responsibility of going and doing that extra bit. And that is one of the things that we want to promote through the RT, the Responsible Traveler Campaign. And yes, uh, like uh, you mentioned, Krishna, we are also bringing out an app in which there will be a responsible traveler situation where you know what the guidelines are for the traveler, for the industry. And we will also have a mechanism of a feedback, which is that say somebody is littering in the uh, you know, national park, for example, or doing something wrong. Just like the police have an app where you can take a photograph and it sends you the location there and then, you know, we'll instigate that. And at the same time, we want to encourage good actions. And we are having a, we are thinking of a plan of what we would call our members, 
the honorary ecotourism wardens. So you give a sense of responsibility to the people who are going in and, and to behave you know, responsibly. So Ali, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Mandy. Am I audible? Am I, yeah. Yeah, so just talking uh, quickly about the Satpura model, as Aniroz was also saying, like in Tadoba, they started offering so many different activities. And uh, Satpura, from the start, uh, in the last 10 years, actually, Dr. Pabda was also instrumental in designing that model. And Mr. Krishnamurti has also been the field director there. So we do... Uh, Apart from the jeep safaris, we do obviously the walking, the canoeing. Mandy, you've experienced the camping. And we have actively promoted this as a park which is beyond the tigers. We also do night drives where we are seeing uh, animals that you don't see in the day. So partly what Mr. Krishnamurti was saying, all these are part of the MP park rules. That's why we can do it in Satpura. You know? and each park is allowed camping in the buffer. But unfortunately, and it's good for us because we kind of claim it as an exclusive activity. But in other parks, people are not really utilizing uh, those facilities which are sort of given by the forest department. So that is, uh, you know, one thing. But uh, what Dr. Pabla was saying, I think by diversifying the activities, uh, some of the questions that I had is by diversifying activities, we can actually utilize more of the area of the park. I know we are governed, uh, uh, you know, by NTCA guideline that doesn't allow more than 20%. But somehow as an industry, we need to actively engage in, uh, you know, uh, a discussion with NTCA to enable larger areas with lower impact. And there you can do some jeep drives, you can do cycling, you can do camping, walking, and actually have a larger area, uh, you know, under the park. So that was one of the questions which I wanted to ask also so the forest department people and, and the other panel, panelists who are here. Apart from that, uh, also uh, one thing which I know a lo lot of people have an issue with, not in Satpura that much, but in the other part, is the roster system, which, uh, uh, which I think, Mandy, you also mentioned that guides are very important. Uh, I believe uh, that till there's a roster, a guide will never be motivated to become better because they know mera number to aane wala hai next time, you know. So as soon as there's a bit of incentive to be able to, uh, you know, have a like a booking system, then only the guide will be motivated to uh, improve. And same way with the jeeps also, you know, like lodge as a lodge owner uh, in Satpura, we have a some, uh, you know, because there's a river, so forest department operates the vehicles, so it's a completely different model. But in the other parks, uh, in MP and maybe other places also, but definitely in MP, there's a mandatory roster which has to be uh, followed. So if you're, a, say, a high-end lodge, you cannot utilize your vehicle uh, and you have to take a vehicle from a running roster, which could be good, which could be bad, and there's no incentive because it, it, uh, you know, a number is going to come next so there is a waiting charge which you can pay but you know that is not uh, driving uh, you know a, a fair uh, model and lastly the third thing is about the pricing which we were discussing i think the price is uh, uh, good uh, that uh, you know 1500 at least in mp is not much but i just had a question last year we had a meeting where you know a year ago there was a, a stakeholder meeting where the government decided to freeze these rates for, I think, five years, uh, you know, to keep the stability uh, going. But now I think it has changed to an increase. So I'm not for reducing because we know that it goes for conservation. Uh, but definitely in this uncertain time, if we can freeze it for at least a three to five year period, that will really help in promoting long term, just like Varun and Mr. Kalra uh, were saying. So with that, I'll just hope I can, you know, get some responses. Thanks, Ali. That was a valid point. And I think we take a take a, a strong point about this whole price structuring. My only subsidiary point to that is that I wish that the national parks would also come out with uh, some clear guidelines as far as the post-COVID rules. And in that, we also need to understand whether, just like we've done it in trekking and rafting and, you know, several disciplines, a very, very specific thing on 
the type of wildlife safari. So if it's a walking safari, what's the protocol? If it's a canoe safari, what's the protocol? And if it's a jeep safari, what's the protocol? And therefore, if it requires us to have two customers in a jeep because of COVID, I don't know, whatever is evolving, we need to create that. We need to freeze the price on it and then communicate it out. And obviously, we need to keep a little bit of an eye on the, uh, on the price structures when COVID regulations hit. And then on a longer term, I, I think it's totally fair to say that, you know, uh, 1500 per se is not an issue. And of course, we can harmonize many things. May I ask now, uh, Harbhajan, for your comment on this very crucial aspect, which is that clearly we've got some great practices happening. Clearly, we need to allow them to seep into other states. How can we use a vehicle to create that mechanism where we communicate, may, maybe even on a monthly or a bi-monthly basis? Uh, perhaps you can get Amity involved or a forum or a webinar or something very simple as a call to action where we get a bunch of you know, private industry people, we get a bunch of our field directors and we say, okay, let's get the ball rolling. And from there, maybe we can, you know, establish whether do we have to have the center involved? We have only at a state level. So over to you, what are your thoughts? Because that clearly is one of the biggest pebbles in the, in the shoe of tourism as I see it now. Uh, thank you, Mindy. I think there are uh, three action points uh, where we need to become active. One is about uh, finding out the good practices and uh, spreading them over to places which are not uh, following them. Uh, I don't think the park directors or park managers can do that because they are concerned with their areas are the best they have uh, access to their own state government and all governments are independent. I think it is the, the duty of uh, bodies like uh, RTSOI industry representatives whose who, number one first should document all the best practices, then maybe create model practices which everybody should follow and then uh, engage with uh, whoever makes the decision, both at government of India level and the state level and park directors level, uh, so that they, they go down to the people who actually have, have to implement them. So uh, first job for RTSOI would be to document them. You don't have to maybe order a study or anything because your people are everywhere. So if you get the rules and regulations from everyone, then ask uh, somebody in the, in the uh, one of the members or some, some consultant, somebody to, to kind of amalgamate them into something model which everybody should follow. I think everybody would be keen to do that. Park directors, the states would be very happy to do that. Only thing is they, because it changes uh, every very regularly. Today, you don't know it's there. Tomorrow, you know it's not there. And if I think it comes from... Uh, uh, respected body like yours, and uh, maybe you can have a directive issued from government of India. Although it's not binding on the states, but definitely they heed to what government India says. Uh, if not, in the tigers, of course, tigers are uh, advice is binding. But any directive from government of India do have a value. So best would be for us to consolidate, compile the list of best practices, and then see who makes the decisions and and uh, interact with them. Second part is uh, about uh, industry not selling anything other than uh, game drive. This has been a big pain for me. Uh, my uh, very keen interest was on promoting everything except game drives. But because nobody wanted them, nobody sold them. So I rather retired a very disappointed person, uh, except that we were able to push our uh, ideas in, in Satpura to a little bit. Although not everything we wanted to do in Satpura, we did. But as the game drive, canoe drive, they, they became popular and they, they now now stabilize. And every time I asked the power directors, why are you not pushing these things? They would always say, sir, nobody wants them. I had some meetings with the, the industry, uh, the local lodges. Uh, everybody said, yes, yes, we will promote. I think uh, probably the fault is not only with the, the industry as much our fault. We have not actually put our uh, hearts behind uh, this thing. We have not publicized, we have not reached out to the industry. Yes, next year, if you don't bring this, we are going to be tough on you. We'll have some negative thoughts about you, something like that. But I think if we send the message across, and uh, do create an opportunity for people to, to experience the park in different ways. 
Uh, it may not happen in one year or two years, three years, but as we have done in Satpura, I think it will happen everywhere because there are people who have varied interests. And uh, this is a great way of uh, minimizing the impact while uh, maximizing the gains uh, from tourism. I think third action area, Mandy, would be to interact with the NTCA quickly. Because uh, to me, these three things uh, in the NTCA guidelines have been hurting. One is the concept of tourism zone. So, that, I mean, we, we concentrate, we confine, we pile up all the impact into the best parts of, of the park, which we always wanted to protect, actually. Because tourism was happening in the best parts before NTCA came into being. So then they said, you cannot go beyond that. Some parks don't even have 20 Satpura, if I remember, doesn't have more than 5% area open to tourism. So I, the number one, our uh, gains from tourism are very low. Number two, uh, we are impacting the areas that we want to protect uh, the, the, the first possible way. So I don't think the NTCA guidelines are cast in stone. Even Supreme Court said uh, in the, the, the order that we are not sanctifying these guidelines. If anybody is unhappy with the, these guidelines, then you can go to the NTCA and if necessary, you can come back to us. So uh, number one is the tourism zone concept. I think number two is that uh, the way we, we calculate the carrying capacity. Not that I want more uh, vehicles to go into these limited areas, but I want uh, people to go into larger areas in larger numbers so that the gains are maximized. Uh, this, uh, the way we calculate uh, carrying capacity, uh, the methodology might be a little suspect, but the, I think the intention is to keep the pressure minimum in those areas while uh, confining in small areas. I think we have to improve in both sides. Number one, the way we calculate carrying capacity. I think we, uh, there are any number of models all over the world. This was a method which uh, somehow NTCA selected, which was initially not meant for uh, regulating tra vehicular traffic. It was meant for regulating uh, traffic on, on trails, on walking trails, and then it was adapted for uh, doing it here. And I think the third point is that uh, NTCA guidelines do not talk about any other activity at all other than game drives. They only talk about carrying capacity in terms of vehicles. Uh, that is the one area where I think we should uh, uh, interact with NTCA to tell them if you want to minimize impact on the parks, they are, they are rightly concerned about the impact on, on the parks. So the way is to, number one, disperse your uh, tourism as far as possible. Number two, change your, the way you, you calculate carrying capacity. And thirdly, tell your park director, field directors, and, and, and then the states to promote other modes of enjoying uh, parks. I don't think we can leave it to park directors and local lodge owners only. I think we have a very uh, wonderful setup now in uh, RTSOI. And uh, you have your reach. You can always talk to people in Delhi. If Delhi people can influence everything that, that happens on the, on the ground. So I think larger responsibility lies with RTSOI now rather than only with the parks and, and the lodges. Thank you. Uh, OK, that, that is uh, actually very useful. And because in most of these webinars, we always want to have a kind of a practical call to action button that we must always press. Can I uh, request Krishna, and I'm sorry we, we've we lost uh, our other park directors on the panel, oh, uh, Shiva, who couldn't get in because of some audio issues. And Manoj is probably chasing some poachers or tigers or whatever. But I think most of the important contours we've uh, sort of traversed over here. And uh, Harbhajan, absolutely a point well taken. We've got a lot of work. I know that we've all been working together, yourself as one of the key leads with, with our CII National Committee on Tourism, which is also driving along with RTSOI and TOFT uh, uh, initiative to respond to the draft ecotourism guidelines <clears throat> of the Ministry of Environment and Forest. So policy. I think a lot of these areas will, uh, you know, the policy, yes. Uh, so hopefully the next uh, webinar, we get into some micro things. I can see a lot of questions now going up. Uh, so Shobha, do we have uh, some time before we close uh, to take on about uh, 15, 10, 15 minutes of questions? Yes, we are all, we are actually 
uh, already two minutes uh, beyond our time, but I think we should quickly take about three, four questions, primarily addressing some of the key points that were spoken about here. Should, should, I, uh, should I take yeah. it on so or will you I, do it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, you take them on, but can I just ask Krishna, since we've got you as our captive today, uh, can you help us by putting, if we can do an email loop, so that when we walk away from here, we will have some follow through action. And can we talk to you and my industry colleagues here and we'll put, uh, you know, Harbhajan in a mail and all of us to just get the ball rolling. Let's just quickly put down a set of best practices, a set of pain points that you think, you know, the travel industry or the tour operators or uh, travelers should be doing and we will take it over to our industry friends at different forums and start you know chanting that mantra of the right action that is needed so that after today the one thing i don't really like is that you come on podiums and all of us give great ideas but nothing happens so i want to make sure that it's going to go and you know hit somewhere on the ground so over to you shobha let's get a few questions that are crucial and then we can field it across to our panel Absolutely. Uh, so we have a, a question from our ambassador, uh, Dr. Latika Nan. For MP parks, could research be shared with stakeholders? Uh, this is important as without translation of research findings and recommendations on, into a form that the common man can use, there will never be true understanding of what is happening with the parks. Unnecessary rules need to be stopped, like not being able to be allowed, uh, uh, allowed to put down wind shields. Yeah, there you go. So, Krishnamurti, sir, you want to take that yeah. one? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I think whatever the research uh, has been done in the different parts, so once the research uh, paper is finalized or when they submit the report, it's available in our uh, library, particularly in Kana. So, I think anybody can come and they can access our uh, research papers or the book, whatever they submitted. So that's the first part. Second part is regarding the unnecessary rules and all. So actually, see, these rules are evolved over the years. It has not come yesterday. So uh, we had uh, every year stakeholder meeting. All the decisions were almost, uh, so all the decisions were, dis dis all the issues were discussed. Then we decided. Like some uh, Mr. Ali was raising the roaster system. The naturalists are not allowed to drive and all. So that's not an issue because the roaster system was brought basically to bring a decorum and decorum at the gate and to uh, provide a, uh, facilities to the guests so that easily they will get a vehicle. So otherwise what will happen, there, there used to be a lot of problem even in Kana before this roster system. So the roster system has brought a sense of discipline and there is no problem in the gate when you go in the early morning in Kana, in any gate, Nuki or um, Katia gate. So that we, uh, we consider these points, but we have to provide employment to the local uh, community. So the roster system is the best possible uh, methodology which we are adopting right now. And uh, for uh, regarding the guides and all, uh, you were telling the guides are not educated. We, we do uh, regular trainings and all. There is a system of uh, grading in Madhya Pradesh, the G1, G2. And as we get the feedback from the uh, uh, guests and we conduct every year the, uh, some test and we upgrade and also we downgrade also. So there is always incentive for the guides to learn. So that is one of the best practices which we are uh, following here following in Kana. So I can share the best uh, tourism management practices of Kana with uh, the panel. I, I, I think uh, Krishna, what might be very useful going forward is actually having a closer kind of a, a conjunction with our tourism industry. For example, your guides could be very in their let's say the, the spotting knowledge, for example, but they may not have such a great ability to communicate. They may not necessarily have the manners or the mannerisms needed for client handling. And I think these soft skills are where our bodies can come in, like the lodge owners, the federation of restaurants and hotels, the, you know, because even in rural tourism, the government of India tried this in the past where there was these organized, uh, these organizations from the, uh, you know, private industry trying to help with these soft skills. And I would love when you do your grading, to have a member of the private industry sit on your grading panel and say that does it meet the requirement because they are seeing it from the eyes of the consumer. So maybe that kind of synergy is what we want to bring on the ground. You know, so just one suggestion. And I'm sure a lot of these ideas 
we can evolve and mature and it is you know uh, basically trying to see how we can always better a system so, uh, so my, pro that, my, propo uh, my proposal for this is that see every year we do training to our guides and all why, do why don't somebody who's interested who want to give some inputs to my guides about the handling the guest and their behavior or some knowledge so they can come and they can give uh, maybe one or two sessions they can handle we welcome anyone who wants to continue there you go. That's and one, the skills one, there's one positive point right now and I will put so, it to my industry colleagues, so the lodge owners, that we must have a system where we can give these guest lectures on, on you know, absolutely all this kind of... Uh, and, and, and even for grading also, we not only take the department, we uh, call the local naturalist and the local uh, local uh, resort owners to decide the grading and also we involve them also. It's okay. not that only department Kana is doing it. Yes, thank you, Mr. Krishnamurti. Okay. Varun has a question. Uh, Go ahead. It's, re it's related to you know what you've just uh, been talking about. Uh, I I think there is a, a sort of a feedback system on the, the GPS app that you have. But uh, the challenge that I have seen is not many guides would ask us as guests to actually give that feedback. And that is something if that can be monitored better, you will have instant feedback on your system in the way that you want to collect it. Yeah, Mr. Varun, yeah, we know that, uh, that some, sometimes the guests also don't give. But this is a system which we just started two years back. I, I mm. say even out of 100 guests, even if 60% if they give a feedback, it gives what direction or what uh, inputs I am getting it. So I think we should be happy even if 70% yeah. of the people, if they give the feedback, I think it's a fair uh, data. So I can yeah. assess. The but no, I, I always like to say that, you know, we must remind ourselves when we are all particularly in anguish or in in a charged up sort of activist uh, role uh, and we want to better uh, things, Rome was not built in a day. But so long as we know that we are on the right track and we are going in the right direction, it's, you know, thumbs up. So, um, uh, Shobha, do we have any other questions? Yeah, or? there are several questions. I'd like to take a couple of them because they, yeah. they are directly uh, in line with what is being discussed. Uh, mm -hmm. One is from Archana Singh, who says, as per the Indian Wildlife Act 1980, tourism is still considered as an anti-forestry activity, which in other terms means uh, it is harmful to the forest. Whereas globally, we have seen many cases like gorilla tourism, etc., uh, has played a pivotal role in conservation. Why do you think India still doesn't consider ecotourism as conservation tool to safeguard our forest and wildlife residing in them? So. So I should I should ask uh, Herb, Herbajan to come in because I know we have some good news lurking on the side. So why don't you reveal it, Herbajan? Uh, I don't know which good news you're talking about, Mandy, but I don't think her impression is correct. Yeah. Uh, ecotourism or tourism in, uh, uh, in the, the Wildlife Protection Act is not a prohibited activity. Uh, so we've been doing it forever and we'll probably continue to do. Uh, it was going to become a prohibited activity, uh, not as because the law wanted it, but there was some uh, government India directive, but now there's no. So it's allowed. Uh, although sometimes some people, you know, try to interpret the law in a slightly different uh, way. There's one word called inviolate areas in uh, tiger reserves. So inviolate means uh, even tourism is prohibited. So it's a question of how you interpret it, but uh, the law very clearly says the wildlife warden can allow people to enter parks uh, for the purpose of tourism. So let's not, uh, but yeah, yeah. I'm, so it's I, not, not prohibited at all. Yeah, actually I was uh, alluding to uh, the paper that we've been working on on the draft ecotourism policy oh, where at yeah, least okay, the government okay, has okay. agreed, uh, you know, that uh, ecotourism see, right, right. will be considered a forest activity. Uh, so, so it's, it's, much, it's, uh, Maddie, it's not related to the wildlife act, it's related yeah, to the forest yeah. conservation act. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So but that's a good silver earlier, lining. Government India had sent out some uh, circulars, not exactly circulars, so written to some states in, in the context of some specific projects, which they did not uh, uh, see as something which should go with the regular forestry activities. Uh, but those uh, so the letters got circulated all over the country. People started interpreting them that ecotourism is completely unwanted activity in the forest. So now in uh, the new uh, draft uh, ecotourism policy which the government of India has circulated, they have, I think the most crucial uh, point is that they will now recognize tourism everywhere in the forest areas 
not as a as a non forestry activity they recognize it as a part of uh, what we call incidental to conservation thank you sir there is, this, yeah, yeah. there is this one question from sharavanan which is uh, uh, directly in line with what we've been trying to do at rtio sir which is about trying to make the travelers responsible uh, he says he's been doing a lot of trips in most of the parks like kaziranga kana etc even though a lot of instructions are being given uh, for the drivers and naturalists uh, about the discipline to be followed inside and during sighting everything vanishes the minute uh, the sighting happens should we think about giving an orientation to the tourist before they enter inside the park mandi can't hear you sorry yeah yeah uh, this is this is a absolutely done deal it is part of the guideline and as i said if we in design an intelligent app where we can actually also uh, you know garner some amount of wrong action because i think we are fed up in india in general about not being able to point a finger sometimes when wrong actions are done because you know it's not the done thing i mean you see a guy spitting on the road or doing something stupid i think you know somebody needs to have a reporting mechanism you can't go on on this uh, thing so it is part and parcel of the responsible traveler situation of a feedback mechanism and i hope we'll be able to sensitize people in a more proactive and a more incentivized way of being more responsible so i i hope uh, all that will kick in so one last question and this is i think more for the uh, tour operators and lodge owners and what they think um is that uh, we uh, no it's about pricing strategy uh, peer zada fayaz ahmed from kashmir and he says hello to you um, mr kalra why shouldn't we have lesser entry fee for indian nationals and increases in the foreign foreigners entry beside additional fee for movie cameras and professionals we must encourage school and college students visit these parks and sanctuary at, at a very nominal or no fee so uh um, Who, who's taking that on do you want me, do you want me to take this question mandi Yes, uh, Ravi ji, if you, if Mr. Kalra, you, if you can, and then we'll have Mr. Pabla yeah, give his yeah. points of view on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you see, a point taken, but the thing is, you see, there are two types. And you speak of students. Yes, there is a need to sensitize our students, to make them aware of our heritage, of our national parks, of our flora fauna, and definitely, yes, that's that's something which the government should really seriously think. If there are student groups. and it's a study tour there should be a different pricing for a study tour that i totally and completely agree with but when it comes to a difference between a foreign tourist and a domestic tourist that probably is a is an area where i would not not rather go because the most of the damage to the national parks is being done by the domestic tourism who takes a chips packet with them who are eating and thing and doing all sorts of damages to the park and bringing a sort of a you know so there there if you want to stop the mass tourism into the parks then you have to make it worth its while so if you the moment you reduce the fee to the domestic tourist it becomes a recreational activity for him and he litters and he, he shouts and he he does every sort of thing but if you make it extend he understands the value Of, uh, of 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 the of the you know visit to the park and he, he he gives a lot of lot of respect to what he sees and also uh, you know we have this capacity problem in the park the carrying capacity problem so if the tourism has to happen and if you have lower tickets for the domestic tourism there would be no fun as be able to enter or get the jeeps because there will be no carrying capacity so i think i'm quite happy as a tour operator uh the perspective i mean i'm quite happy with no disparity between a domestic and a foreign tourist in the ticket pricing but yes the students that's a very valid point and i I've, i've said but what i want for students say. i just wanted to say in madhya pradesh for students we give 50% uh, reduction in the ticket so i think any uh, educational institutes when they want to take a tour to any park in madhya pradesh but the thing is that they have to give an application to us so we will uh, reduce 50% uh, price and coming back to some other right. question regarding the rules and regulations and also government indeed supports ecotourism and promotes ecotourism as a park manager i have to 
adhere to the rules and regulations of the state government and ntc and government of india so i have to work with these all the rules and regulations so uh, the rules as rules are there to make the tourism more responsible and to provide better experience to the guests that's okay what I want to thank do. you mr krishnamurthy uh, sir you mr pabla you want to take uh, you want to say yeah, something only small uh, we used to have differential uh, rates for foreigners and indian and uh, the pressure at that time used to be to have one single uniform rate uh, because it was uh, somehow seen as uh, below our dignity uh, because we thought we were a growing economy we become uh, world power or something so we shouldn't be treating foreigners differently than us so we continue to raise the prices for uh, indians uh, so that uh, they finally now have merged i think let's uh, stay with that number one number two uh, ravi i think our parks are much cleaner even indian uh, visitors are now much more responsible than what they used to be i think the major need is to clean up the environment around the parks outside the park where uh, industry has to play a role because we see a lot of garbage around the parks in the villages where uh, your lodges are located and we damage their infrastructure use their resources and uh, they, they suffer a lot because of our presence there although there are some benefits but i think there are negatives as well but inside the park i think uh, i've seen a major transformation now i never see um, a chips bag or a polythene bag or even a bottle of water inside the park uh, these days so that that's why uh, i i agree this has become far better yes i agree with you i think we, but, but i think a major effort has to be mounted by the industry and the parks and maybe civil administration to clean up the areas outside the parks because uh, the damage is the same where the ultimately all the garbage is going to go into our drainage systems and to our rivers and uh, into the sea then we are going to kill uh, whatever uh, the garbage kills so absolutely thank you mr yeah, pavla that's you. a fantastic point because like uh, responsible tourism uh, uh, like rtso i believes the integrity of upholding the destination is one of the primary responsibilities of the traveler and the tour operator to keep it pristine and clean and the resources that are available first of all belongs to the community and the resident and the host communities thank you for that one uh, uh, interesting thing that goes about uh, it, it talks about communication and marketing uh, is from akhilesh dube and this is our last question uh it's time to change wildlife sales and marketing strategy indian wildlife should not be run around uh, tigers only time to give slogan and market more aggressively about indian wildlife beyond tigers uh, and some collectively work on basic infrastructure of lesser known parks and sanctuaries to grab the attention of domestic as well as international travelers i think i think that's a given isn't it so dr pavla i think that that we are all on the same page that i think if, if satpura has done well ali is happy and people who visit mm. that park are happy any park can do well i think that is already happening and there are a lot more yeah. smaller parks that uh, even travel operators are focusing on now yeah. and a lot of new experiences are being explored west bengal there are some very interesting parks which are being explored you know ladakh himachal i mean there's so much being done uh, so that is already something which is in play and we'll see results very soon absolutely any other questions uh, ali varun uh, uh, ravi ji i have i have one last thing that i want to talk about and i know there are certain parks that do it very well and then there are certain parks where it is completely lacking and that is uh, restroom facilities within the park a four hour drive and i know central indian parks have done a fantastic job you know kana has amazing loose pench has an amazing loose you know places like ranthambhor and i'm i'm sorry i couldn't address this to mr manoj but uh, you go in for a safari there's no loose available and the chokis that you stop at uh, you know a large number of people are just going in and around that area but i guess that infrastructure can be put in as uh, you know seen in central india so that is something that you know if we are sending a whole bunch of people inside we need to put in this basic infrastructure and you know a, a clean loo is something that can be managed i think in my mind excellent point varun one more Ali. thing Sorry. one more thing uh, shobha i mean there's this practice of checking passports uh, physically for you enter the park enter the park now the covid post covid i mean and to promote the contactless uh, travel uh, and you know to avoid the contact as much as possible 
there should be something done about checking physical checking of passports i think they'll have to all a system where a lodge on on a should be responsible for doing that excise and providing those photocopies to the park authorities rather than the clients carrying their passports in the early mornings or during the game drives and that being physically checked thank you absolutely so so ravi i think these and many other suggestions that had come in earlier and so on we are going to put this in a working document and start sharing, and sharing with our uh, parks and you know make a make of a plan it's all well made i think uh, shobha we need to probably close before we do that we yes. need to ask our president rakesh mathur to come yes, and uh, give a very quick uh, comment and uh, pa- perhaps a vote of thanks to all our wonderful panelists and if he is somewhere connected then over he to is, him he um, is yeah, yeah he is and a sort of if you can make mr mathur as a as a panelist please thank you mr mathur mr mathur is rakesh mathur right Yes, yes Mr. Rakesh. Rakesh Mathur. Yeah, he's and, there. Uh, I can see him there. Okay. Yeah, he's there. Arun. I mean, as as a good Mathur in India, he might have had the call of food or you know <laughs> some delectable <laughs> kais uh, khana that they are famous for. But uh, anyhow, yeah, he's I, there. I yeah. think I see him. Yes. Okay. Can I? Uh, ah, there you are. Am yes, I heard? Yeah, 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 but not seen. not seen you you're, you're like the tiger heard but not seen not seen <laughs> reveal, reveal uh, yourself yes sir we you see you yeah. okay come along okay uh, mandy let me just first say what a what an interesting and what a riveting discussion this has been and uh, even before mr pabla came back dr pabla came back the second time i had already penned my thought that rtsi is going to form some kind of a committee to to formulate a review mechanism uh, for all these all these various discrepancies that have been brought to our attention whether it is charging of fees whether it is you know different policies issues that varun told, spoke about and i was going to say i was going to request dr pabla to chair this committee so uh, <laughs> dr pabla i think uh, uh, this is one point i'm going to going to uh, ask mandy to take you upon uh, because i think your guidance and your your whole thought process on this whole issue is so interesting that as, as an rtsoi team and you are one of our honorary members and mentors so uh, i'm going to request you to take that on uh, i had flagged a few issues um, i think one of the key things that comes out here is that it is the responsibility of the tourism fraternity to sell things other than tiger and i think we have a great role to play in there and also um, you know for example if you look at places like bitter kanika you know the chambal wildlife sanctuary the eagle nest uh, the snake park in bangalore the crocodile park in uh, in uh, chennai i mean these these products these these parks are not marketed the way they should be and just to run after tigers and wildlife parks is, i think we'll have to move away from that uh one or two uh, areas of concern uh, which i may perhaps be wrong but it had been come, it had come to my attention that some constructions were coming up in buffer zone now honestly speaking i i do not have uh, uh, actual data but is something that has come to me and i thought if it is true then we need to really really do something about it very fast the second thing that i i want to raise a red flag on is we need to have construction guidelines around park uh, i think a lot of our uh, small towns and villages mm-hmm. around designated parks are very quickly becoming you know uh, high construction zones with multi stories coming up i think that needs to be tackled the third thing that i needed to red flag is the issue the fact that a lot of these destinations are being used for incentive meetings and conferences and weddings which is all right i think uh, if the environment is good there is no harm in getting married there there is no harm in having a conference there but the but the thing to do is to prevent complete noise pollution and um, i think that is an area 
which leads which to my mind leads to the like that. Having said this, uh, I'm not an expert in this, but uh, as, a, as a citizen, as a concerned citizen, I think these are some of the points. With this, I'd like to thank Mandy for putting together this fabulous webinar. I'd like to thank Shobha for for managing it so well, and incidentally, I'd like to thank the entire audience for for participating. And ladies and gentlemen, this is not the first. This is not the second webinar. We are now coming out with a series of webinars on different different topics and subjects, uh, spearheaded by our very own uh, Shobha Mohan. So thank you very much, and over to you, Shobha. Yeah, thank you. It's just to quickly uh, sum up and round this to say it was very, very interesting discussion. And of course, there are a lot of other things to be discussed, a lot of many more things to be discussed. But the good news is uh, there are going to be a lot more sessions. Uh, stay tuned in. We, uh, RTSY is ready for membership. You can write to Anjana Dheer, um, who's uh, here, and it would be a pleasure to uh, host any questions that we've left unanswered will be uh, answered uh, by emails and we will send them all back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pavla. Thank you, Mr. Krishnamurti. It was a pleasure having you. And thank you, Raviji. Thank you, thank you um, Ali and Varun. Thank you for your time on a Sunday morning. Thank you so much.